Well, my full name is Denzel, Z-I-L, not E-L like Denzel Washington, but Denzel Eugene Jones. And I was born uh, September the 21st, 1910, in Morrow County. It really wasn't in a town. It was, uh, it was up on, a, on one of those wheat ranches, just about halfway between. I, the, my, my dad always said I was born in Ione, but I really was born up in this ranch house. And uh, Frank uh, Anderson owns it now. Or, like the matter, uh, uh, a legislator that was down here that I can't call his name right now, but he, he uh, if you remember, he, he lit his, his helicopter on the lawn here a time or two, and then they stopped. Sumner, Jack Sumner. Yeah, he owned the place where I was born at one time, or his wife did. Well, of course, uh, my dad was uh, born and raised in Hebner, and, and his folks were all drowned in the Hebner flood, and that happened the uh, 14th of June in 1903. And, uh, and then, uh, then we, we went to Montana up there, and uh, my mother died when I was five years old up in, at Grass Range, Montana. And then we come back, and I went to the first grade in, in uh, Portland, first uh, first grade school, and then we moved to the John Day of Wheeler County, and uh, I was there until 1924. Then we moved to Prineville, and I went to high school in Prineville, and while there, why, I uh, rode went and rode racehorses for old old Bertie Kidwell had a one horse and. Uh, and put him in with a couple of horses from Portland, old Jack Hoffman had, and they sent me to, to British Columbia, to uh, Vancouver, and then, and then Victoria, uh, and then went from there. That fall went down to Tijuana, Mexico. I was 15. I could do 97 pounds saddle and all. I went two years to high school, and then uh, I had a stepmother that. Uh, I couldn't get along with, so I had to leave, and so I, I just went up there. I rode race horses for two years, and then, and then, my gosh, I wintered down on the Metolius River, uh, down at the mouth of Fly Creek, and uh, and and then, then I got to hearing about those old buckaroo tales, you know, from over in Harney County, when the old Spaniards and and um, Pete French and all of them, and so I got the urge to go over there, and I went over there in 1928 and never left. Well, he was alive, but he didn't, uh, he wasn't able to handle my stepmother very good. The e easiest way out of that was just to get out. Right at the ranch that we bought, that I wound up buying, I went to work there for, for Joneses who were distant cousins of mine, went to work for Jim Jones, who later got to be a state senator, uh, and uh, went to work for $50 a month on my board. And then just uh, kept uh, working and scratching. And they had four ranches at the time. They had the, the ranch down on the river that I bought, which was uh, the railroad. When it came in there in 1912, well, they named it Jonesboro. And uh, then they had a ranch, two ranches at Juntura and then one up above Druzy. And uh, of course, then the, the uh, Jim, Jim was the youngest brother, and then his next oldest brother died, and so then they had to settle up the estate. And Jim wound up with the, the ranch at Juntura and the one at Jonesboro. And then I went into a partnership with him, and uh, from from uh, thirty-nine till. January of 49, and uh, we did pretty well and put some cattle together. You know, at that time, after the Depression, the terrible Depression, you know, in the early 30s, and the drought, that, which started in 28, uh, you know, after that uh, got over with, the Depression, a recession, or what the heck ever you want to call it, you know, it's pretty hard to do anything wrong. If you bought a cow one day, she's worth a lot more the next day, you know. So we hit the times pretty good there. And 
and Jim had had to sell. He had, they had about 1,300 head of cattle, and he had to sell them all in order to get money enough to settle up the estate. So then him and I started fresh without any cattle, and uh, we bought uh, cattle and just started putting them together. Right, he furnished the money, and I did the work. And, it was just great because nobody had anything, nobody needed or wanted anything, you know. We eat three meals a day and, and you had clothes enough on your back. And, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, cattle were just, uh, were just cheap. The government would pay $25 for a, a fat cow, you know, otherwise we couldn't sell them. And let me tell you this, during that time after uh, Roosevelt got to be a uh, president, why he would pay two dollars a head for sheep, it did, I mean for the for the hide, and uh, you'd just kill the sheep and skin them and it cost you ten cents a head to get them, I mean if you hired it done, to skin them, and then, uh, and then he'd pay you two dollars for that hide. And I know Jones has had some sheep at that time and they killed a bunch and, and I hauled those carcasses off over and dumped them in a, in a little ravine over, and I can show you those bones yet. And you could not give those carcasses to anybody. I mean, like the the people on well, well, there wasn't any welfare, but the people on the county then could use some of them because they were fat sheep, you know. But you, you couldn't do that. If you did that, then you didn't get your two dollars for the hide. So that's what it was like. Uh, but you know, we didn't expect anything. We raised lots of the food we eat, and you had to just buy sugar and flour and coffee, you know, it was about all. You had your own meat and milk and all that, and you raised your garden, and you put it in the cellar and all that. Heck, we didn't expect any more. Well, of course, the uh, wages, of course, started going right up, but let me finish that during, during the Depression, uh, wages, ranch wages were a dollar a day in your board, you know. And you talk about people now that get to, you know, <laughs> get, what, $30 an hour now. <laughs> we got, we got uh, $30 a month. And if, it was, if we was lucky enough to get a job and the people had money to pay us, even that, then I worked for Dean Goodman up there uh, after my wife and I were married. And uh, I worked for $50 a month and boarded myself. I furnished my own fuel to heat the dang big old house that we had to live in. <laughs> you know, there wasn't much left uh, at the end of the month after that. And things began to, to move. Of course, that was about 34, 35 along there, and things began to move. And then, of course, the highway was come up through there, you know. And the highway was built through Jonesboro down there in 31 and then went on up to Jersey, and, uh, and they were paying, uh, I know, in uh, Drinkwater Gap up there, that uh, was kind of chalk country, you know, and, and uh, I got, uh, I got, I worked one day on that with a number two shovel <laughs> by hand. We was shoveling, sloping the banks of that cut, big cut, and that is for Turtling Construction Company. And, and that same day then, Dean Goodman come down and offered me a winter job, which I had to take because uh, this was not going to last very long, you know, just till I got that cut done. So I, I worked there one day and got $4, which was good, and then went to work for Dean Goodman down at Junter there for $50 a month and board myself. But I had a a wife and a child to take care of, so you didn't have any choice. You just did what you had to do. I stayed there all winter and uh, and the next spring, and then uh, I got a, an offer to go up to Jersey to uh, to work on a ranch and my wife cook, and we got fifty dollars a month and in, uh, in our board. So, guys, you know that was a big deal. We saved some money there because we didn't have to spend anything. And uh, things just moved on, you know, from there, and you just did what you had to do. See, in 39, Jim and I entered into this, uh, Jim Jones and I entered into this partnership. And he just simply said, if you'll come down, and uh, you and your wife, and 
and her cook and and run the two ranches and I'll I'll use the ranchers for security and we'll buy cattle and uh, we'll we'll set up a, a rental figure of twenty five hundred dollars uh, a year for the the rent on these ranches and in and at the when we get these cattle put together well, we'll just split it down and so in ten years we we had put together twelve hundred head of cattle paid for by God so then uh, then that's when uh, he uh, offered to sell me the ranch and uh, we, we what we agreed to do was to sell 400 head of that 1200 head and split that money up and then we'd split the other 800 head that'd give us 400 head apiece and he would take the upper ranch there at Gunter and sell me the Jonesboro ranch and and uh, these these 400 head of cattle we bought brought me $55,000 which was made a good payment on the ranch. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is January of 49. But you see, we were there in, 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 during the 40s. And, and let me tell you, we, we, uh, the uh, irrigating uh, system that we had uh, come down that's one side of the river and then across the river and they had an old wooden plume across the river. Well, it is about ready to fall in, so we had to do something about it. So Jim bought a a uh, highway bridge off of Union County up La Grand, just above La Grand there, a good bridge, 135 feet long, just which fit there. And uh, by golly, we tore it down and moved it there and put it up across right there and then put the flume on the outside of it. And uh, we did that in 45, and we didn't get electricity till 44. And so, but in '45, we, we we had electricity enough to run run a drill and one thing or another out there on when we was putting the bridge up. So we just went on from there, and and then uh, she gave us seventy-five thousand dollars for the ranch, and and then it paid fifty-five down on us, so I only owed twenty, and it only took me two years to finish that up. So. But like I said, it it was pretty hard to do anything wrong then, you know. The way that the things were going, even though old FDR borrowed the money to do all this with, <laughs> it still still happened. In '35, it's when we got the Taylor Grayson Act. That's the greatest thing that ever happened to us because uh, you know we we had we had about 23,000 acres of, uh, or I mean, about twice that much of of deeded land and, and federal land fenced in, you know. And uh, before the Taylor Grazing Act come in, there lots of trench and sheep in that country, like the country's 50 or 75,000 of them. And you know, they just run out there south of us and, uh, and just eat all the range off. And, and they, didn't own any, they didn't own any ranch, uh, own any base property. They never hired any help. They never paid any taxes or nothing else. You know, they were pretty hard to deal with. So that's the greatest change that comes yet uh, was, uh, and that, you see, that put those tranching sheep out of business. They either had to go buy a ranch because the, the Taylor Grazing Act says you've got to have base property. They said if you will, if you have base property enough to run your stock for five months, we'll run, we'll furnish you uh, land for seven months, which was, that's what happened. So the the sheep that were really transient sheep, they just went out of business, and uh, and the others then they just stayed, and uh, and uh, things, uh, you know, just. They just kept getting better all the time, cattle prices, and and we could. Uh, I got out of the partnership with 400, but then I could uh, build up to 600 because we were commensurate for 600 head on on each ranch, and uh, with the the BLM, and and they were great. <laughs> they only had three hired people in the whole Vale district down there at that time, and now I got I don't know how many we got, but anyway. We just went on this, uh, and of course I had a son and a daughter, and the son, of course, he 
he was born in 32, so he was getting big enough to help on the ranch. And by golly, him and I run that ranch ourselves. You know, he was, he wasn't, a, he didn't care for horses. It wasn't a buckaroo, but he was, he was good with machinery, you know, which fit good. I could take care of the, the cowboy and part of it. And uh, well, he'd help, but then he kept all the machinery going. We made a great pair because we, you know, and I was giving him uh, interest. He was earning an interest in the ranch. I didn't give him anything. And then he got married and uh, and started his family. And then his wife uh, didn't seem to care for for us, so she came up. We built us a new house up by the road, and she come up one morning and said, "Well, you folks can either leave the ranch or I'm going one or the other." So, what the heck do you do? Five little kids, and so so we left. We went moved to Ontario in uh, in '71. Well, uh, it 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 didn't really change as far as everyday work and things is concerned, except that I was my own boss, and I didn't have to you know, to do something to please Jim Jones or anybody else, and and was financially, uh, you know. I served on the budget board, and it's, I served on the, the uh, juvenile council and and things like that, you know, and on the local school boards and, and for nine or ten years and uh, that kind of thing. You know, you just, uh, people ask you to, and uh, if you're... Uh, inclined to get involved in, you know, in, in the community and, and do things. Of course, you naturally usually start at the local school board, you know, and you fight up there and, <laughs> and for what you believe in. And, and uh, then county-wise, you know, and you're always concerned about budgets. And, and I was on the county budget board and uh, so on. So. Uh, I was just conservative and tighter than a bark on a tree, and so on. So uh, you know, I just, uh, I just, uh, just went on and put that thing together. Actually, with hard work and and a change in the times. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to take a lot of credit that isn't doing me because, like I said, the times were just a change, and then you could do those things, you know. Because. Our daughter-in-law had run us off the ranch, and we were just sitting down there in Ontario doing nothing. And I was not completely unknown because I'd, I'd been involved, you know, in local politics around there. So the business people just come and come in and said, uh, "Why don't you run for the legislature?" And they said, "Now don't tell them, tell us that you don't have time because we know them side better." And so I thought, well, just as well, didn't have anything else to do. So. It never entered my head to get in uh, in politics such as the state legislature at that time. Well, I run against Nita Bellows, who was, uh, had worked for Tony Atturi, and it's pretty hard for Tony to support me because he liked Nita in, uh, in the primaries. Of course, she was a Republican, but I beat her by 400 votes. And then, uh, then I had a young uh, boy by the name of Tim Gallagher that uh, run against me in the in the general election and uh, we just uh, I didn't have any money of course I didn't know anything about it. I never asked for any money net well in fact I never did ask for money I, only uh, only uh, only one one term I sent out a few letters asking for money but but anyway uh, I beat Tim by 1500 votes in 72 and come down here greener in a gorge, you know, didn't hardly even know where the bathroom was. It was, it was unbelievable, Chet, uh, the experience, uh, uh, so different. And you got to remember that I never had education, you know, I only went two, through two grades in high school. And uh, of course, there's other kinds of, uh, education that you can get, <laughs> that you don't actually have to go to school to get it. And, uh, and I got a lot of it right here. And you soon learn the people that you can confide in, ask questions of. And for one thing, the one thing, the main thing, and the biggest thing 
is to tell the truth and don't go back on your word. That's that's the that's the key to being a, a legislator. And some of them don't do that, but by golly, uh, once they kind of learn that you do what you say you'll do, it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong, you know. There's always two sides to the issue, and, and uh, if you just stay with what you believe in, and of course, but I, you know, I fit my district real well because they're a more conservative nature up there in Eastern Oregon, you know, and so that, that was a great help, and it was easy to legislate to, to please them because I was more or less like them, you know. Well, but, but Chad, look at the money you got out of taxes. You got $16 a thousand, and I used to know our assessed value, but I kind of forgot it, but would tell you how much school money you got, and then, then the, uh, the, uh, the other, the, the money from the state lands issue, you know, and, and then, they, then they set up the basic school support uh, issue fund, and then we had the federal forestry seats, which there's 18 counties, 19 counties in the state that get federal forestry seats, and uh, counties like Harney and, and Lake were getting about $4 million. And uh, of course, that was that uh, federal forestry seats money was split 75 25. 25 schools and 75 to uh, for roads in the counties, except for four counties, and Grant was one of them. They, it was 50 50 in, in Grant, I think, Wallow, and I don't remember the other two. But anyway, uh, but how it come, how it worked out was that that federal forestry seats did not help the counties, the school part of it, because it come off of, a, of the basic school support. There was a statute, and I used to know the number of it, and I forgot it, but it just simply said that any any money like that would be subtracted from your basic school support. So they really didn't benefit except that it saved the basic school support fund because it offset it. But you see, uh, with uh, Harney and, and Lake County both getting about $4 million, and Grant too, well then that's a million dollars that was going into schools that, would, that the basic school support was saving. Well, um, I had learned a heck of a lot, and the people that I was working with had also learned something. You know that uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't propose things that uh, were out of line in the first place. And if you got a reasonable thing that uh, that would basically be for the Eastern Oregon as well as the whole state of Oregon, then you get support from the other side as well as uh, as your own people. And then, of course, we didn't. Uh, we didn't get in the majority till 91, and then we were in the majority 91 and 93. I guess we've been in all the time since then, haven't we? I think uh, after about two sessions down here, I, uh, uh, without Reagan, I think I learned pretty fast. I think it. He, I think he could see the handwriting on the wall when he didn't run again. Let me put it that way. He's entitled his philosophy and uh, the people that uh, supported him and so on. But so am I, and I think it just as well be left unsaid. Of course, uh, dang it, Neil was. You know, he was all right. He was just. He was just liberal, and uh, that was his philosophy. And he just uh, run it that way. And uh, uh, I can't remember if he's doing this any good. There was a, a lady by the name of Freddie Webb Petit, and she was head of the uh, Human Resources uh, Adult and Family Affairs, and, and uh, she got kind of carried away and bought a bunch of expensive Jeeps and <laughs> Jeep Cherokees and one thing or another, and we had to take heard a task about that, and they sent uh, uh, John Yonker uh, give him the task of 
digging into all the things that the money she'd spent, which she didn't have. And yet, at that time, they had the whole two-year budget that it's available to them. They could spend it all the first month if they wanted to, which she damn near did. And uh, so then uh, John Yonker's report was, when he came back, was that, well, he thought she needed to be moved, replaced, or whatever. And they also set up the, the deal with, for only six months at a time. The budget could only, you could only have access to money for six months, and then you had to, re, had to reevaluate what you'd been spending it for, and so on. So, and that was good. And then, so she was removed from her job with the human resources, and I think Neil took her into his office for the balance of, the, of her term, or his term, that is. And that was one of the that was one of the big issues because human resource department's a big department and a lot of money. Well, of course. Uh, Paul Hanneman was here all the time, and uh, he was minority leader one year, and uh, of course he was on Ways and Means. And by the way, Hardy Myers, uh, and we, we, need to, we need to talk about Hardy sometime. Well, uh, Hardy Myers was one of the uh, most fair uh, leaders we, we ever had. And even though he was a Democrat and so on, but he's the one that set up the proportionality rule. And that simply said that proportionate to how many Republicans there were and how many Democrats there were, there would be that kind of representation on the main committees, like Ways and Means. Well, then when Vera came in, she did away with it. And it come back to haunt her, I'll tell you, after, after, she, after we got in the majority. But uh, Artie Myers set that proportionality rule up, and do you know that he he appointed Paul Hanneman, who was a Republican, to chair a, a committee on Ways and Means, which was never, never happened before. I mean, you know, whatever party was in, was in control, and they, they got all of the, the chairmanships. But I guess that, that's hardy. He was just so fair, and, and uh, he was in this particular subcommittee, and I don't remember which one it was now. It really doesn't matter. but. He thought that Paul could do a better job there than, than any of his people, so he just put him on it. And, uh, and he was, he was uh, speaker for two terms. And then Vera was speaker for three terms. And then Graden Kearns was speaker for one term. I think that's when we come, took over in 91, and Larry Camel was speaker for two terms. And, and Larry was probably uh, the most expensive uh, speaker we ever had, even though he was a Republican. But he he uh, he extended the uh, the uh, legislative session for 30 days, longer than anybody ever did. And John Minnis was co-chair. Overspent the budget by 170 million dollars, and uh, then Larry broke up the Ways and Means Committee, which is a joint committee, Senate and House, and and created the Appropriations Committee, and put John Minnis ahead of everything, and there was five, almost five meltdowns in in John's committee because he just couldn't. He just couldn't run them in. So uh, old Larry, you know, uh, and he's got a plaque that John Kitschar would give him. What a great job he did. Well, I guess he did. He had a long time to do it. Had an extra, extra 30 days. Let me bring in the, uh, the uh, Division of State Lands and the state land issue. And of course, we had Jim Hill on our side, and then uh, was uh, Barbara in uh, in Keesling on the other side, and uh, you know they was they was trying to put those state lands, those grazing lands, which there's 670,000 acres of of state grazing lands, and they were trying to uh, put them up for competitive bidding. Well, there's no way that we could have 
competed with the environmentalists and the people which would have picked and choose some of them and would have taken that out and then it would look what it would have done to the to the industry and uh, we fought that thing until Kitzharber got to be governor and, and believe it or not he he helped us on that and then I was involved in that and we finally got it settled now we have two 15-year leases with we have a 15-year lease with a option to renew for 15 years and we appropriated three and a half million dollars to buy out the the grazing privileges on those lands which was uh, you know that was the part that they were using because these were these were grant lands and therefore the statute they interpreted statutes to say that you got to get the best you can get out of them well we we bought out to give three and a half million dollars, which went into the common school fund as a trust fund to buy out the privileges to graze on that land. And that took the, uh, the fiduciary uh, responsibility away from them, away from the, the board so that they didn't have to approach it then from the standpoint of the highest bidder deal. And it's been working great ever since. Oh, I don't know if I had any, but I never, uh, I never wanted to be a, a speaker or majority leader or minority leader, either one. And uh, I just, I just kind of wanted to uh, represent the people that sent me down there. That's about all there was to it. Although, as you well know, the Ways and Means position is a prime spot, you know. When you get there, you want to stay there and you don't want to lose it and so on. Actually, uh, uh, we had a hotline, uh, you know, once a week and, and they would congregate down at the city hall and that would be in the morning early, uh, like at 7 o'clock their time. And uh, and we'd just go over the issues and, and they'd be... Uh, uh, people there, the business people there that were involved in these different issues, as well as the general public, you know. And uh, they would just tell me their views about what was going on, and I would tell them what had progressed down here from our standpoint, and what was beneficial to us, and what wasn't, and what I was going to vote no on. <laughs> and uh, that's, that was great, you know. And uh, the uh, uh, for some reason or other, uh, I never got along with I never got along with the, the newspapers very good, except I, Ontario I did, but Lake County wouldn't print my, and neither would Klamath, and neither would Burns. You know, uh, I guess I was just too far out from or far in or whatever from my standpoint. Uh, uh, Tilly uh, down at Lakeview, she just wouldn't she wouldn't even print my my monthly newsletters, you know, so hell, I just quit. And uh, then uh, Patty O'Connor, who was the reporter for the Herald News in Klamath Falls, she wrote a story and really benefited me, and the publisher didn't like it very good, so he... And then my opponent, who was Kathy Jordan, Jordan at that time, she she threatened to sue him over, over the article because it was taken her to test because she had told a lot of lies on me. And so the publisher down there, he he then printed one on her side. So, so then they, I fell out with them. So I didn't have to worry about the papers too much. A lot of the urban legislators, they just thought the world of, you know, and uh, I'd visit with them about issues and we'd just, we'd just, discuss the issues and they'd have their points and I'd have mine and we never did fall out about it, you know. Tom Mason was one of the ones that real hard you couldn't you couldn't do anything with Tom. Uh, he kinda had his own ideas and kept to himself until he got here on the floor. <laughs> but anyway, generally uh, generally speaking from a you know, a general standpoint by uh, uh a lot of the, the urban legislators were great, great people to to talk to.
what we were trying to do, Chet, was get equity. And we worked on the equity issue for years and ways and means, you know, and how you do that. And we kept uh, raising the, uh, the, uh, the amount per pupil. And like uh, my last session down there, it was $4,320, I believe, that each student was supposed to get, you know. Well, the problem was that there was a district up at Lake Oswego, and there their cost was $6,000 a student. And there was one from uh, McMinnville, I forget the, the district, and theirs was 5500 Well, they continued to give them that money because they had the boats down here, you know. We couldn't, and as far as equity was concerned, well, equity was fine, you know, if you could make it work, but then they kept getting their their extra money, which they weren't entitled to, and they had some programs that they were paying for that was that was put in when when there were tax dollars available for the district, and, and they just continued to do that. We never had the votes to to change it, and those are the issues that really get to you, you know. And then we had the small schools correction deal, like the side house out there only had two pupils. Well, you know. When he, he only got what they were, the rest of the people were getting. So we had had, had that small schools correction deal, so that issues or a district like that could still hold hold school, and they would get some extra. I think I believe that about the highest district per pupil cost was up in Wallowa County. But uh, anyway, uh, Lake Oswego and the one out here at McMillville, but we're over the. The, the limit that we had set for equity. We spent a lot of time on there, simply, simply from the standpoint of the way after ballot measure five, they never had any money to for maintenance anymore or to upgrade their, their schools. And then, then they poked down our throats uh, the uh, mandatory consolidation, you know, and uh, they began to do that then and, and which, uh, Never, never suited. Back to the matter. That's what uh, defeated Don Oaks. Don Oaks uh, was from the district from '59, District '59, and he recommended the consolidation of school districts down here and lobbied for it. And he never got back anymore. You don't do that up in, in like in Eastern Oregon and those kind of places. But they finally got it done, and. Uh, they're doing it. They've done it now. They they consolidated Willow Creek into Vail, and when you do that, then you you eliminate a board. You got one big board that runs the whole damn county. The equity thing is is great. We have too many administrators, and uh, that's one of the big expenses, you know. And uh, if we could iron those things out. And then, then what I think we need to do, I think that if a district has the votes and the money to build a new schoolhouse, then I think they ought to be allowed to do it. But that should be like a, a two-thirds vote or something like that, you know, not the plain old simple majority vote. But so, so you get the real feeling of the people that's going to be paying the bill. But the way it is now, you can't do that. And and you don't get money enough. The state doesn't have the money to to take care of the maintenance issues or, or build new schools or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's a constant thing. It's probably worked on more than uh, more than any other budget issue, especially since. And then when uh, the lottery come in, you know, and people thought that it should all go to schools, but it don't say that. And uh, the last session that I was here, the take was $750 million, and I don't know whether it, I think it's that for the biennium from the lottery. And then in 80, I believe it was 85, uh, or 95, I mean, when Gordon Smith was president of the Senate, he got the, that bill passed, or it was actually an initiative or a referendum passed to take 15% off of the top of the lottery money and go into this trust fund every, every, every year. Well, if you're collecting about $350 million from lottery a year, 
then 15 percent of that's about 50 million dollars that's been going into that trust fund well this year it was a ballot measure which would have give 220 million dollars to schools but the people didn't understand it so they voted it down and what are you going to do with that money if you don't use it for i mean it was for schools it says it's for schools but what kind of i mean what kind of schools are you going to, what's it what are you going to use it for and i think if now that people understand it, I think if it was presented again, they'd pass it. And, uh, you know, if they'd have done that, then the $110 million that they took out of school budget to balance this budget with could have been, they could use the whole $220 million of that and replaced it with this trust fund money. They didn't do that. We met with her as a member of the land board several times, you know, and uh, and let me tell you what happened. We was meeting once over in the, in the land office, and she was there, and she had to leave, and she voted by phone out of her car on that, which I questioned whether that's proper or not. So Keesling, he was there, and Jim Hill was there, and and uh, Jim Hill voted against it, and Keesling voted for it, and then she voted by phone up on her way to Portland, some damn place to pass that, uh, that issue that we were discussing, and it wasn't to the benefit of us Eastern Oregon people that was using the land, I can guarantee you that. But anyway, we, uh, after Kitsar we got in then, he, he got on our side, and we, Got that all learned out. But see, Barbara, uh, that's just one of the few issues that she was so far out on on the other side. Did you know that she was, they, they attempted to recall her at one time. At that time, why the environmental issues were, were coming in, and of course, those are always there, and we're always fighting them. And, of course, that's her philosophy, you know, and that's fine. That's, I've got no problem with that, except that she's supposed to be representing the whole damn state of Oregon, you know. And I think you're supposed to look at both sides of it when you do that. I could talk to her any time, uh, but uh, never did any good. She was governor when the, uh, when the first uh, prison was built in Ontario. And that was $42 million to start with, and then I think, I think they finished up at $370 million or something like that when, when they added the $3,000. Oh, it was just a small, small one, but uh, anyway. But there, there's another thing, uh, Chet, that we, we got into a real uh, discussion and a heck of a deal over the sewer system with that uh, present there, you know, and uh, actually the uh, the uh, city of Ontario went back on their word, and I got on about that, and, and I really I really chewed them out about that and told them to just make their word good, and see, they had, a, they had a agreed in, in the contract with the state of Oregon to furnish sewer facilities for the present out there, then they, and they doubled their fee and tried to back out and all that. So anyway, we got it finally straightened out. But that was a heck of an issue. And, and the state spent a ton of money, like $600,000, trying to dig a new stilling pool or whatever you call it over there up on top and all that damn stuff. And that it was a waste. We just uh, uh, dealt with the issues as they was dealt to us, actually. And uh, you, you do that. Now, I already mentioned the $600 million. And uh, Ontario, the just HC in Ontario, uh, they, they complained that they were losing a lot of money and they got $800,000 because of that argument. And then they got another 800000 or so because of when, when they made the shift from ballot measure five. Uh, well, so they come out smelling like a rose, and uh, they had to hide some of that money around there for a while to keep, <laughs> them. 
making them use it again, but that's some of the things that went on there, you know, and that's my hometown there. And if, uh, if I'd have known it, I wouldn't have, I didn't know that it happened until after it was all over with. But uh, you see, we, we as legislator, le legislators or legislatures had to deal with with ballot measure five and the new the new deal and uh, what it did and what in it is like uh, like the cities and so on had to deal with you know it all involved them too but so uh, the, the different source of revenue for for to run those anybody that paid taxes was supportive of it because they didn't really know what the outcome of it was going to be and so on and my gosh even my house in ontario you can't believe how it, it took about fifteen hundred dollars taxes off of it and the ranch cut the ranch taxes in two another thing that happened uh, after that was that we we got uh, the exclusive farm use passed you know and uh, and one of the things that was happening there was that people were selling out down in California and then coming up to Oregon and buying ranches, you know, twice the value that there was, and that's what the assessed value then was based on. So we got the exclusive farm use passed, and it was based on the, the ability to earn, and it's still on the books today. And I'm, I've often wondered, you know, why they don't try to get rid of it, so the liberals because most people are taxpayers and uh, and they would rather do it from an income take income tax standpoint than they would of, of, of a mandate for for like paying school taxes so yes uh, you know even though uh, it's tough it's a tough issue for schools because now it's it's down here and when you talk about reducing the tax burden for schools or on us taxpayers from uh, $1,600 down to five. Why? It, uh, and I, like I said, I used to know the assessed value of the state of Oregon, which I don't anymore, but, or I forgot. But anyway, uh, it leaves a, a big chunk of money. Well, what is it? Five billion, isn't it? School, school budget's $5 billion out of 12. That's a, quite a whack out of the state budget. I don't like sales tax personally, and besides, if I was still in the legislature, I wouldn't dare support it, because look what Ontario gets out of Idaho. God, you go over to Walmart or some of those big stores, Kmart, and, and count the Idaho licenses on cars that's outside of buying things there. Well, gosh almighty, we'd, we'd dry up and blow away if, if we, if we had a sales tax, we'd lose that Idaho, those people from Idaho coming over. I've always, and I usually get in trouble over this, but I th just think we need to live within our means. I don't think it makes a dang bit of difference how you get taxes. Uh, uh, income taxes are, uh, are probably the fairest kind of a tax there is. If you make money, then you, you pay into tax, and uh, other taxes, tax people that can't afford it and so on and uh, so uh, uh, and this budget what's wh why do people think that it, we're in a recession now but why should wages still be up and all that kind of stuff be up dang it there's an easy way to settle this budget shortfall is, is just cut things down to, to fit the, the recession and that's what I'd be doing if I was down here. But that wouldn't go over very big either. But uh, that never bothered me that much. Just uh, continuing on with the old ones, like uh, Oregon Cattlemen and the Farm Bureau and, and things like that, and then Chamber of Commerce and uh, the uh, different social clubs there in, in town. I uh, would uh, speak with them and or speak to them and then... And, and, uh, uh, ask them, and all that kind of things, and that's that's where you get your the best information that you need to do what the people want you to do. That send you down there, you know. 
And of course, the two, the Oregon Cattlemen Association and the Farm Bureau, they're the two farm groups that you, uh, and then you, you, you protect the extension service and the, the experiment station, which we have uh, one there in Ontario, you know, and, and they do a world of good that people don't even know about, you know. Well, I bitterly opposed to term limits, and and let me tell you why. And uh, uh, and I we were down at Klamath Falls, and and uh, Tim's and Gene Tim's and Bob Smith were both there, and they were campaigning, and they they got on first, and they both supported term limits. Well, why would Bob Smith be supporting term limits? Christ, he'd been in here ever since 1960, someplace along the line. And so when I got up, I said, well, I'm bitterly opposed to him. I said, I'd be a hypocrite if I supported term limits. As long as I've been in here, it's fine for me to be in here for 20 years, but I don't want anybody else to be in here that long. And I said, damn it, the, the best term limits we've got here right now is the ballot box, and if they want you out, they'll take you out. It's just that simple. Not that there's just as many good people that's never been here as there has that's come and they will still come and so on. There's lots of good people, but you know, you this experience, you don't get it overnight. And uh, like if you're going to serve three terms here, you just found the bathroom about the end of three years and begin to do the people that sent you down here some good. And if you're bad, hell, all they got to do is vote you out. Wally Priestley uh, had in introduced more bills than anybody in the, in the legislature. And I got to tell you about him, when his bills, they were just not paying attention to him. And they, they, beat, or they, uh, they uh, did away with 40 bills of his all at one time in one, one, one motion, just a motion to, uh, to do away with the 40 bills of Wally. Wally was, uh, he was one of the most far out people that you ever saw. He was bitterly opposed to, to the military and anybody that served in it. In fact, there was a, a Vietnam veteran that spoke to us up at the podium here and Wally walked out in the gallery over there and stood there and booed him all the time he was speaking. Now, there was, uh, there was two or three of us who so wanted to throw him out through one of them windows with the window shut there, but of course we didn't do, dare do that. But that's kind of a. But I, and, and Wally used to live up in the lounge. In fact, he'd stay up there at night sometimes, sleep on the couch up there, and he he eat up there all the time. And and uh, he he de <laughs> he demonstrated one time with a bunch down there on Broadway Bridge in Portland and. Uh, and uh, the news was out that he would threaten to jump off the bridge if they didn't do what they wanted him to, this far out group that he was with. And so the next session he was back and I said, Wally, was you really going to jump off of that bridge? <laughs> he, he, didn't like that. he didn't like that very good. But anyway, he was, uh, I guess he must have fit his district because he was in here about, he was here about three terms. I guess he was here before I come. And then, and anyway, yeah. and uh, Sid Bassett, he, he used to sit up on one of the front seats up there, right in front, and he, he had lots of good stories to tell, old Sid did. But uh, then uh, he, was, he was from Grants Pass, and he was taken out, but, uh, uh, beat, uh, but he was here for several terms. But uh, the, uh, you know, the, and I've mentioned the, the people that was, uh, it was old, like, I, I jotted down some of them here, the people that were that I like to, to work with, you know, and I've already mentioned Bud Barris and Jeff Gilmore and Dick Magruder and Paul Hanneman and Paul Walden and and Hardy Myers and, and Roger Martin, he was a legislator. And you know, Vera Katz, he she she was speaker for three years, but she always treated me real good. I, you know, she just treated me like one of her own. She'd put me on the e-board and put me back on Ways and Means, and which is, you know, uh, I know that she must have got some static from her own people for not putting her, her Democrats on there, but I got it. I don't know, maybe she thought I was doing a fair job, but uh, uh, I remember, 
I remember one time that uh, the uh, the majority vote was it was had to be a recount down in Klamath Falls on uh, on Bernie Bernie Agron's and uh, they had to do this recount and if if the count stayed like it was well then we we took control but the recount then uh, elected Bernie by oh, half a dozen votes or so got over here and just come running down to ways and means hooping and hollering said we won we won we won you know and so that extended her tenure then <laughs> for another session but uh, uh, one of the things that she she poked old, that old House Bill 3565 down her throat to her next year after when Larry was Larry's first year as speaker and uh, and that's one of the worst things that's ever happened they don't give diplomas out anymore they give Kims and Cams or Sims and Sams or whatever you want to call it and, and uh, you've got to make up your mind when you're in 10th grade what you want to do and I mean what your major is going to be and all that damn stuff and, uh, it just it just has never worked and there's a lot of people that don't like it now as well as they thought they was going to like it then but it's still there so I guess they don't like they don't dislike it too bad or they'd get rid of it I think when you're when you've got an issue Chet, that's really important to your people or the people of Eastern Oregon or the the uh, conservative people and you lose that by say one vote why right? it's pretty frustrating really and uh, but you know uh, uh, Staff Hansel who was he was on Ways and Means in fact he was co-chair one year and he sat right in one of these seats right here and uh, there was an issue with marijuana you know and they wanted to legalize marijuana here in uh, and of all people, he supported it. And for his, the props that he brought in, he, and he didn't drink, he absolutely didn't drink, but he went and bought a bottle of whiskey. And uh, he had some cigarettes, packs of cigarettes, and a can of snooze, and he put them all on his, on his desk there, and he went all through this, you know. And he was supporting this uh, deregulation of marijuana. And, uh, for him to go through all that and with his philosophy usually it was quite a shock to all of us. But, uh, and of course that was the, the Tom Masons and the, and the liberal element, they all wanted to to legalize it. But I don't remember, I think it must have, I think it passed here, I think with, with staff's uh, performance that he put on, it passed the house, but it failed over on the other side. So, but anyway. <laughs> uh, and staff then, he, he went to work for, he was the uh, head of the executive department for a couple of years and, and then he put in the rest of his time on his hog ranch. He never did come back into politics anymore. Of course, the caucuses, there's where the, there's where the work's done. You know, you, really, you usually resolve everything as far as whatever votes are available in the caucus. And then, like we were in the minority all the time, we were always short three or four votes. So then, you, the leadership then would, uh, like the speaker, the majority, the minority leader, then would go to the other side of the aisle over there and try to scrounge up enough votes to to get your bill passed. And if you didn't, well, it just didn't pass. That's all. When I got put on the emergency board, and and then on ways and means, that's that's the basis of of things you know if you don't have the money to run the state of Oregon why uh, then the other other things they don't they don't matter much but you got to have money to do the things that you're that you're supposed to do and uh, uh, I was on uh, I was on a, a subcommittee in ways and means for the state police and uh, and uh, they were having a squabble with the union at that time and and uh, the uh, the union uh, prevailed and had to 
pay them some back wages and raise their wages. And it, it cost it cost a ton of money, like 150 million dollars or something like that. And so they they come back down there to get some more money. And of course, we'd already passed their budget out, and they didn't have any. We didn't have any money to. But anyway, they said if you I forget what it was now, but it was a small amount. They said if you'll give us that much, we eat the rest of it. So they they canned a bunch or. There was some state placemen that were about ready to retire, and they let them retire and never replaced them. So they, that, that was a, an issue, you know. Then, then a, a, the other issue with the state police was the fish and game part of it, you know. There was always a, a budget there that uh, funded some of the, you know, uh, I think nine of their officers from the, from the wildlife standpoint. And, uh, and that was always tough to get because some people had the idea that the, that the license should pay for, for the policeman there and so on. But uh, anyway, but uh, that's, that's the big issue because your schools and, and your agencies, uh, the, you know, the Human Resource Agency, which is the biggest agency down here, and, you know, they're all involved around money. And uh, they've just got bigger and bigger. And then, of course, Kit Harbor's main, his pet peeve is his, his health program, you know. And, uh, and that's fine up to a point, but how far do you go? It costs a ton of money. And how far up the ladder do you help people? And how many uh, things that's wrong with you do you in that category, do you fund and all that? And that's been an issue this time. And of course, he wants to raise taxes, which we would never do. And don't forget that in, what was it, 79, that we re, we reduced the income tax down to 9%. You know, that was a quite a, that was a quite a thing. And the other categories, I mean, the top, Bracket and the other brackets we re re reduced those some t er, down too, and they they've been that way ever since. But one of the other big issues is the retirement, and that's a pet peeve with me. And now, you know, they've always told us how damn well they were doing, but it was all on paper. They was buying uh, bond or stocks, you know, with their surplus money. And when the Dow was worth eleven thousand dollars, now it's down to eight. Well, they, and they never they never got any revenue off of those. Uh, I mean, it was just it was just worth it on paper if you cashed it in, got the money. Why well, you you had a lot of extra money now that those stocks are no good. Well, now we're eight billion dollars in debt. The state of Oregon started taxing the retirees. And it was against the, the statute, very plain in the statute, that you cannot tax a retiree. The state of Oregon can't, but they did, and they started doing that. And, of course, there was a big who were all with that. And, and uh, so John Yonker came up with the idea that we would continue taxing them, and we would increase the benefits by 9%, which is... The, the amount of the tax, the state tax. And uh, that would offset then the, uh, the tax part, and they could continue to tax the retirees then, even though the, the statute said you couldn't. Well, by the time they did that, then they, we, we had run up a bill of $400 million that, that the state of Oregon had taken from the retirees. And so then they, they paid it all out of the, the BRS account. And to the, the people that, had, that they had taxed, they paid them back this money that they had taken away from them. But you got to remember now that the 9% tax that they're taxing the retirees goes into the general fund, but the 9% increase in the benefits comes out of the PRS account. And... <laughs> I don't think you can do that. <laughs> and Jack Solis says, 
he's the attorney for over for them, and he's about to come off the wall. So I suggested to Tom Butler the other day, I said, you know, one way to get some money back is to have the state of Oregon pay off that debt to the PRS at $400 million and quit taxing them and quit tax, quit, and then cut their benefits back down 9%, which would help the PRS account, but uh, I doubt if that goes over very big. It, it certainly did, Chet, from the standpoint of, you know, you just, you just get to appreciate people uh, more, and, and as, just as a civilian, like an old farmer, you never hear about the, the things that's going in on with the, the different uh, types of and groups of people, like down in, oh, you read about it in the paper, but you don't really get into the, the details of it, you know, and you really, down here, you get to hear from all kinds of people, like there was two ladies that come before the, the subcommittee, they, they were addicted to gambling, and intelligent looking women, both of them, and they said, you, you just don't know what this does to us. And they were both addicted, and they had spent all their money and everything they could get and sell and was still gambling. And if you remember, we put a portion of the lottery, went to the counties to help for gambling addiction, and then they ruled it unconstitutional, and I don't know what they're doing with it now. But how would you ever know that there are there there's supposed to be seventy thousand gambling addicted people in the state of Oregon? How would you ever know that? You know, if you and and I feel for those people because it's you know it's a it's a disease with them. I guess it is. I'm so damn tight that it would never bother me any. But then there are people that it just gets you know to gets under your skin and you can't help it. I guess. You know, I just thought, well, you know, I've I've been down there all these, these years, and I've done my part, and so uh, why would anybody, you know, bother about asking me anything? But my God, the phone never quits ringing. I keep telling them that I don't have any whiskers left anymore, but then they still they still want to want want me to do things, which I'm tickled to death to do because I'm, heck, I'm not. You know, I don't have anything to do really anymore since I sold my ranch and so on. So uh, uh, there, uh, there is, uh, you know, you just uh, there's a wealth of knowledge down here that you acquire by being here if you're if you pay attention like you're supposed to, and so on. So uh, there's things that you can pe help people with. You, of course. But you've got two types already to start with. You've got the liberals who believe that that you should have a handout and, and the government, whether it's federal or state or county, should provide it for you. And, and that's fine. That's their own business, except that if you're a business person, and that's what the legislature really should be mostly made up of, of those kind of people that that's met a payroll and all that. Well, dang it, uh, you just got to you just got to face the issues. Now, why why in the world would you want to raise taxes when things are in a recession? For God's sake, you ought to reduce them if anything, because what the hell's business going to? And and look at the the big companies that's going out of business. Even you know, Kmart was what they took a chapter eleven the other day or. And look at Sears Roebuck, they've cut down. And Montgomery Ward has completely quit. And God, how many more of those are there? Uh, and you still want to raise taxes? God almighty, why don't we just face the issue and live within our means? And if it comes back, we're well, fine. Uh, you know, and the, the salary people, they want more salary, but what are you going to pay it with? Now, and this is one thing that I don't disagree with. You lay off a bunch of people. Why not cut all their salaries and keep all the people who are working instead of laying off a third of them and paying the, and raising the rest of them? Don't make it, you know. Of course, that philosophy wouldn't go over very big with the working people. but. Uh,
But then it never bothered me. That's one thing that never bothered me too much anyway. I just kind of told it like it was, or like I thought it was. It worked so far. So you gotta, you got to face the issues. You see, when I was lobbying for the Oregon Cattlemen, well, they, they used their desks here for their offices, and, uh, and they, uh, they uh, mended their own bills with tape, you know, and they'd tape out the part in a bill and write in the new part and so on. And that damn glue sitting around on your desk all the time. <laughs> and, and then my first session down here, we went down in, in uh, let's see, it's 60, that one down in the basement there, and they they just took some fences, you know, about six foot high, and fenced us off some offices down there, and uh, you know your neighbor was right there, you could hear them talking and all that. There was a few offices around the edge that the old timers and the Democrats got. Now uh, Wolfer was a uh, young Wolfer. He was a freshman, and he got an office with the door on it. Of course, he was a Democrat, and I was a Republican. I got one with a fence around it with no door. Yeah. <laughs> and then and then the, the next year, or the next session, then I got an office with a door on it. And gosh, that was right uptown, you know. And uh, so then that's when they built the, the wings, and the wings cost $13 million, and then it provided us with all those new offices up there. And uh, when... Uh, when the fellow from Portland retired, and he had a big corner office up on the third floor, a huge office, a nice one, and some large space out in front and so on. And so uh, when Hunt, he was the chief clerk here then, and, and he kind of had the door on out of the offices, you know. And Lloyd Kinsey, he was moving out of that office. So I went to Wynn and told him, told him I wanted that new office there. He said, no. He said, uh, Bill Markham gets that. He's got more whiskers than you have. And I said, like heck he does. God damn it, he's a freshman. He got beat once, you know, and he's starting fresh now again. When said, by God, you're right. You can have the office. Well, that's the way. That's how come I got that, that big corner office up there. <laughs> uh, well, I've already mentioned the lobbyists, but I, I want to uh, I want to really mention them because I have found the lobby to be well. There's both kinds, of course, but then there's some of the best people that I ever met uh, in the lobby, and and they're just uh, you know honest and and I got so I when I didn't have time to study a bill and all that, I just go to them and ask them the details of it, like Fred Van Atta and. Uh, and uh, Rob and Joan, uh, Rob Douglas and Joan Buck, and uh, Roger Martin. He's, a, of course, he's an ex-legislator. And but and John Brenneman, you know, and those are tell you what they're what's in the what's in their issue. You know, they're they're lobbying for an issue, and I think I tell you tell you what's in there, not not just what they want you to hear, but what what all's in there. And like I just say, well now. Don't this do so and so well? Yeah, if, if you really pin them down, then they will they will admit that uh, that that's in there. And those are the those are the the issues that you may miss if you and it the difference between supporting one maybe and not supporting it. And so they just they they got so they they knew me and they wouldn't lie to me. Well, I just tell you a while ago, I take a little John Barleycorn every day, you know, not to excess, but then and that kills all the bugs in you, you know. And I don't know if uh, I, uh, you know, I, I buy my uh, uh, Fanny, uh, Fanny Meyer, she's from Winnemucca, and I have to take her down there once in a while. So she were allowed two, two half gallons of, of liquor from out of state, you know. So if I, I get me. It only costs about half as much as it does here in Oregon. <laughs> the horse fell over with me. She was a cinch minder, and and I didn't warm her up enough, and I just got on her, and she just fell over sideways like that, and I went over with her and hit right on a rock, right on them short ribs there, and broke a rib. <laughs> and 
And I was just starting out in the morning, so I thought, well, hell, I, I would go on anyway. But that was the longest day I ever put in. Yeah, and, you know, people would drive by and say, what in the hell are you doing up there on that house? I said, I'm shingling, can't you see? Yeah, in 97, I had uh, cancer surgery, and they took out 12 inches of my intestines, and, and uh, Rob and Joan, uh, Rob Douglas and Joan Buck, they were, they were nursing me around. I said, for God's sake, leave me alone, you know. And they wanted to drive me down here from my house where we were staying and drive me home. And I said, I can drive. And I was back working in six days. <laughs> 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 but I'm pretty healthy yet. 